Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinges entices the pollinators by planting some flowers amongst the vegetables. OSU Extension Vegetable Specialist Lynn Brandenberger helps us read and interpret chemical labels. Casey finds history and beauty in an abandoned homestead. We visit Johnson Seed Company in Enid and take a walk through a beautiful field producing wildflower seeds. And there's a striking tree in the landscape. homesteaders are some of the most resilient and determined people who've created legacies for families all across our state. Stories of settling the West, statehood, and the Dust Bowl are ingrained in every Oklahoman at a very early age. While we can visit museums, talk with our elders, and read about the past, there are other reminders that we might come across as well. Plants such as roses, lilacs, daylilies, spireas, and irises often conjure up memories of our grandparents. And it's no wonder, because just like our grandparents, these plants have shown resilience and determination in some of the toughest conditions. These plants are the ultimate in low maintenance, being exposed to whatever the weather brings. Freezes, high winds, droughts, surviving without proper water and nutrition, and proving to be resistant against diseases and insects, surviving against all odds. Oftentimes, as gardeners, we get wrapped up in the latest cultivar, whether it's a double flower or a new foliage variegation. Or perhaps we can plant that plant because it only gets three to four feet tall now, rather than the traditional six to eight feet tall. With all of these new options to customize our garden, we may also be getting plants that are a little more susceptible to other aspects. Just like myself and the other generations that have come after our grandparents, we too have more options to go and do and be something different. But it's always important to remember our roots and the value and beauty of the generations before us. about vegetable gardening we often focus on exactly what you might think the vegetables but there's no reason that we can't add flowers into our vegetable garden as well there are several reasons why our vegetable garden will benefit from adding more ornamental flowers now in order for us to get our vegetable fruits most of our vegetable plants do have flowers and those flowers att attract plenty of pollinators on their own in order to get fertilized and produce those fruits that we desire. But adding ornamental flowers will also increase the number of pollinators that come into our garden. 
This is why sometimes we like to direct sow plants such as zinnias and cosmos into our garden. Not only will it attract more pollinators, but it will also attract more attention from people passing by. We have some uh, cosmos here, and cosmos are a great plant that you can just easily direct sow out into the garden. Now adding ornamental flowers to your vegetable garden doesn't just have to be for aesthetic purposes. You can add plants such as marigolds and nasturtiums, which will not only make your vegetable garden look a little more colorful, but it'll also brighten up your salad bowl. You can also incorporate sunflowers, echinacea, and daisies as a way to integrate cutting flowers into your vegetable garden. Here we're gonna sow some sunflower seeds directly amongst our squash. These are teddy bear sunflowers and they only get to be about 18 to 24 inches tall. So they're gonna stay relatively short amongst our squash plants. But they'll just provide us a little additional color as we go throughout the season. And speaking of echinacea, there's no reason that you can't also add herbs into your vegetable garden. Chives not only give us nice fragrant vegetation that we can use in the kitchen, but also provide us with a little flower later on in the season. You can also add dill and fennel, which give us a nice ferny foliage and will not only bring in the butterflies, but are also a great addition into the kitchen. This is one tree that might not get much attention until it starts blooming in late spring, but when it does start flowering, everyone's going to ask what it is. This is the Chinese fringe tree, or Chiananthus vertensis. You can see how it got its name by these lovely white flowers that are all over the tree. And they are slightly aromatic and they have really long petals that when they start falling from the tree, they kind of create a snow-like effect. Now, this is the Asian variety and so it's native to China, Korea, and Japan. There is also a North American native called Chiananthus virginicus. And both are very similar though. They are pretty small trees, only getting to be about 10 to 20 feet tall. Now both trees are typically dioecious, which means they bear male and female flowers on separate trees. The Chinese fringe tree does bloom about two to three weeks earlier than our native. Both flowers are showy, but it's said that the male flowers might be a little bit more showy. But of course, with the female flowers, you get some fruit. It's an olive-like fruit that'll start to appear late in the fall if those female flowers are pollinated. Also in the fall, you'll notice that the foliage will turn to a nice yellow color. And then of course, in the winter, we'll start to really notice this beautiful tan exfoliating bark. Now, both fringe trees appreciate a moist, fertile soil, which might not be ideal for all landscapes. But I have to say that while it might be in a kind of a low area where it gets some runoff here at the Arboretum, it has done fine without any supplemental water for several years now. Without any serious pest or disease problems, you might consider adding a little fringe to the edge of your landscape. here once again at the Cimarron Valley Research Station in the vegetable garden where you can see we have a nice cover crop growing and joining us again is Dr. Lynn Brandenberger and today we're going to talk about how the label is the law. A lot of times we say the label is the law but break that down for us. What does that really mean and what information can we find on the label? Well there's a whole lot of information on the label. Um, not only instructions on how to use the chemical properly, mm -hmm. but also how to keep yourself safe, the environment safe, other people safe that might be around you. Uh, we've got one here that says caution on it, which is the lowest level of toxicity. Then the next level up is warning. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then we get danger with the skull and crossbones. That means like uh, you really need to handle this very carefully. Uh, the other thing it will include would be uh, a group number, and that's to help you with uh, resistance management. 
if you used a 3A, you might spray once or twice with that and then switch to a different group so the pests don't get where they're used to. Right, kind of like plants have plant families, pesticides and insecticides right. also have groups that they're in. Right. So you want to use something from a different group. Correct. Uh, the other thing that the labels will always have on it is it will tell you what type of protective equipment that you need to wear as the applicator. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you want to make sure you read that and then follow that. Uh, the other thing the label will also talk about is uh, other things that might be added to the spray mixture like uh, adjuvants or spreader stickers, that sort of thing, or if it can be tank mixed with other materials. Mm -hmm. And it will actually list the materials you can tank mix it with and make suggestions. So the label gives you a lot of information. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is if uh, by uh, something occurred and you had an accident mm -hmm. and you, you got covered in pesticide and you had some real problems, you need to take the label with you to the emergency room. That's a very important thing to remember. So you don't want to lose the label, obviously, because that has right. a lot of valuable information in it. But what if we do? It seems you've printed a few labels off. Are they always available on the internet? Most, most of them are, okay. yeah. And, uh, you know, different companies have websites that you can go to and, and get labels off of that. The nice thing about those labels is the print's big enough <laughs> that people like me can read it. So. Well, Lynn, thank you for sharing this information with us. All right. Well, I enjoyed it. outside Enid, Oklahoma, and joining me today is John Lamley, who's the research director and production manager for Johnston Seed. And John, you guys sell wildflower seeds, and this is how it starts. Can you tell me about the process of growing wildflower seeds? It really starts with a lot of research in the beginning of determining what will, what's adapted to our climate what we can be successful growing. Uh, same thing comes to what a homeowner might choose. You don't want to put something out there, plant something, that uh, may not survive. I mean, you, you can't get to this point if the plant just isn't well adapted. So we choose things that we can, that'll survive here, uh, survive our winters, survive our summers in some cases. Um, and then we, uh, we basically see if we can, you know, successfully there's demand for those particular products. And uh, then we see if we can successfully produce seed, which over the last 20 some years when we started, we've gotten to this point. We now know a lot of things we can do successfully and that's what we do our focus on. Sometimes I'll add some new ones to see whether I can actually do it, but uh, it's basically time tested and proven. Uh, and of in course, most years, this is one it. of your most popular uh, seeds, the blue bonnet. And we most, know it does well here in yeah. Oklahoma. And most people do not think the Texas blue bonnets will survive in Oklahoma. It's the Texas blue bonnets, mm -hmm. obviously. It's not the Oklahoma blue bonnets, <laughs> but it actually is very winter hardy. Um, about four years ago, three or four years ago, um, we got down to minus six, no snow cover. Mm -hmm. And they survived beautifully. A lot of the canola and the wheat took a pretty good hit. But amazingly enough, the blue bonnet survived quite well and had a really good crop. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's one that I've, it's, it's obviously pretty to do, but uh, we have good demand. And most of the times we sell it back to Texas when they have a crop, short crop. So little does Texas know that blue bonnet's coming from <laughs> Oklahoma. <laughs> Actually, they may not admit to it, but they have no problem buying it I mean, if it's short. So yeah. what are some of the other wildflowers you have growing uh, around here? We also do, uh, the uh, Lanceleaf Coreopsis, a little more commonly known as tick seed. Uh, we do some pitcher sage, a small amount, uh, partridge pea, uh, Illinois bundle flower, the Maximilian sunflower, purple prairie clover, uh, a few of them probably escape me, uh, lead plant. Most of those we, we initially started more to focus on the prairie restoration. Uh, obviously blue bonnets are a little more of a showy, typical wildflower that you think of. But in recent years with the, with the pollinator, pollinator uh, 
it should come out with the bees. Uh, we've started focusing a little bit more on gearing up towards that, as well as the monarch, bar monarch butterflies. Some of those species are required for that. We don't do well, mm -hmm. but we can offset that in our mix by growing some of these we do, and then we can always purchase those and put the blends together. Okay. So it gives us a little bit of an edge because we're growing things that maybe somebody else wants but can't do, yet we can get those so we can we can work together with those companies to so everybody is a win-win situation to provide what needs to be out there to the consumer. And of course, you can't forget that grasses are a valuable component. So what are exactly. some of the grasses that you guys are growing? We, uh, probably the, one of the biggest ones, of course, is we, 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 we produce seeded Bermuda grasses. Uh, with the original, with Gaiman, Bermuda grass was a forage type. Uh, then, of course, we moved into Wrangler, which is still popular. It was, uh, we did, it was developed uh, almost 20 years ago and still is great demand for it as a forage grass. And Riviera Bermuda grass, which was developed also by Oklahoma State, uh, is one that we've been growing for almost 20 years now that is uh, successful around the world. And we've recently uh, developed some of our own. We'll have a new one out this, this spring called Monaco. Uh, that is a very similar to Riviera, but better seed production, um, which should make it eventually more affordable to the consumer. And now getting back to the wildflowers, I mean, a lot of times we don't think of them as a crop, but that's exactly how mm -hmm. you guys treat them here. We, yep. So we, you planted them in the fall? These, the blue bonnets were, um, for a homeowner, uh, you know, you, you would purchase the seed. Um, they are a little bit of a challenge to get to germinate. Uh, they don't, the seed has to soak up, be penetrated by the water, and they have a hard seed coat. So in the first year, you may see, you know, 10 to 15% germination from your blue bonnets. As time goes on, those, that seed will break down in the soil through natural weathering and be able to respond and get water into the, into the, into the seed itself to make it germinate the following year. So it's a perpetual thing once you get your blue bonnet started and those produce seed, plus you have seed from the existing year and it's a perpetual thing, you will consistently have blue bonnets germinate over a span of many years. And of course that's a survival technique for the, the wildflowers right. so that they're not all germinating in one season. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. So now they're blooming. What's, uh, and we're in early May here. Mm -hmm. um, it's, has the spring kind of thrown them off any? It or? has. Uh, they're, they're typically a little shorter than normal. Uh, we've had, you know, just, just as the wheat farmers and the canola farmers have experienced the, the late freezes, the blue bonnets uh, have been somewhat affected. They're shorter. Uh, and they get a hard freeze on them uh, like we've had. They kind of curl up, but they, they, bound, they bounce back. Some of those early blooms uh, might have got zapped, but uh, as you can see, the, there's more come on. Uh, now comes the critical time because these, when the when the blooms themselves will start turning into pods that look very similar to what a soybean would, mm -hmm. uh, but they're more stacked in a cluster. Or edamame for the. There they go. I wouldn't eat folk. these. <laughs> the the seed itself looks, it looks a little like bit like a piece. It looks yeah. like a little gravel. It looks mm -hmm. almost like gravel when you when you get it you know and you get it cleaned up. But uh, we'll basically let it go to pod. Uh, we'll let it dry to a certain extent. Uh, we can't let it go completely like a soybean would and completely dry because they, they have all or most of these wildflowers have a tendency to shatter, natural me built-in mechanism. So you can come out here when they start shattering, you can hear them popping. Oh wow! And especially if you have a heavy dew or a light rain and it turns very hot, they'll they'll just start popping. And that's course, not a sound crop, you want to hear. A, it's not a good thing because I've been there many a times, but. Uh, Depending on you know the weather at the time, we may straight cut them and deal with some high moisture material, or we may swath them and pick them up. But it's, it just depends on the weather and what's going to work. Because last thing you want to do is get them wet in a windrow, like I said, and when they get wet, and then they're going to really pop in that windrow, and you got a problem. So are these at 100% bloom yet, or you? They're, they got a little ways to go. Okay. Uh, there's some that still, like you can see, um, if you look closely, there's some on top that haven't opened up yet. I would say we're probably at 75 to 80. Okay. Uh, and you know, they typically come out a lighter blue, and they're going to get darker blue, and almost in some cases, they almost get a little bit of a purple look to them because they're, they're, so, they're so dark. So in about a month is when you'll be harvesting? Probably pretty close. All there right. again, who's going to guess what the weather's going to do, but hopefully you'll come back and, and uh, We'll show you that process, and we can get them, you know, get them harvested, and then show you how we clean them, uh, and then, you know, and how they're going to end up in, in the consumer's hands to, to be used. Okay, thanks, John, yep. and we'll see you in a month. All right, thank you.
today we're doing sweet potato soup. I'm going to start with about a tablespoon of olive oil or vegetable oil, whichever one you want. Put that in there when the pan is nice and hot, hopefully by now. Uh, I'm going to add a cup of fairly finely chopped onion, but we're going to use a, an immersion blender. You could use a regular blender to uh, make this smooth later. So don't feel that it has to be chopped up extremely fine. You just want it chopped up so that the pieces are all about the same, so that they cook uh, fairly evenly. This we're going to put in here, stir it around a little bit, and it's going to take about four minutes. We want that uh, onion to uh, soften up a little bit, to develop a little bit of flavor, and then pretty much everything else is going in, and the whole process is going to take about 20, 25 more minutes, including uh, putting it through with the, with the blender. So it's fairly fast uh, and uses some terrific ingredients. Now, I chopped the onion ahead of time, uh, and I've got the uh, sweet potato chopped ahead of time. But if you didn't want to do that, you've got this four minute window here where you have plenty of time to scrub down a sweet potato and peel it and, and get it chopped. And so again, the fairly even sized pieces, not uniform completely, you don't need to spend a lot of time, uh, but you want them to be fairly uniform so they do cook at about the same pace. So we're gonna give that about four minutes and we'll come back. All right. Two pounds of sweet potatoes. I'm gonna put that in there. And we're getting all of those fall flavors in here uh, by adding uh, a tablespoon of peeled minced ginger. And again, this is something that you don't have to make sure it's totally fine because we are gonna uh, blend it through later on and, and smooth it out. Now, if you don't particularly care for the, the really sharp flavor of ginger that can be there or the brightness of it, uh, what you could do is, is put a piece of ginger in and fish it out later before you uh, blend it, and that will give you the essence of ginger. Powdered ginger really does not work very well in this particular recipe. We're going to let this cook about two minutes, and then we're going to come back and add basically all the rest of the ingredients to it. All right, we have a few more ingredients that I'm going to add to this. One of them is about one and a half to two cups of cannellini beans or white beans. This is going to give us some protein. It's also going to give us some thickening. If you are using canned ones, you can look for the type that don't have any salt added if you're interested in keeping that down. This is going to need a little bit of salt in it, uh, however, so I'm going to add about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt to the mix. That will brighten the flavor, give it some depth of flavor as well. And about the same amount of black pepper and about the same amount of cinnamon. We've got the ginger, we've got the cinnamon, about the only thing we're missing here are the cloves and we'll have a pumpkin pie soup. And I suppose you could do that too, except for the next ingredient is gonna take away some of that effect and that we're gonna add four and a half cups of beef broth. We're gonna bring this back up to a boil, then turn it down and let it simmer for about 20 minutes or until the potatoes are nice and tender. We're not trying to soften the beans since I used um, canned beans and you would use pre-cooked beans if you didn't use canned. So the, the goal is here simply to get the potatoes soft enough that they're going to be able to go through the blender and uh, get nice and mashed and the soup nice and smooth. Again, we're going to cover it 20 minutes and it should be about ready. I'm going to use an immersion blender. We're just going to uh, try and smooth all of this out. If you want to leave it a little bit more chunky, you can do that. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Now, if you don't have one of these, you can use a regular blender. Just put about half or a third of it in at a time and put, take the center out of the uh, lid and cover that with a towel. Otherwise, it's going to explode up on you and you're going to be covered with hot liquid. So just keep blending this around until you get it to the, the stage where you want it. Okay, that's about as smooth as I want it. Now, if this is thicker than you want for your soup, you can either use a little bit of water to uh, thin it, or you could add a little bit more broth to it. And I'm going to add a little bit of garnish to it, something a little bit different. Uh, and then I'm using a little bit of raw Brussels sprout that I've just shred up a little bit, something to add a little bit more color to it and then a little bit of sour cream right in the center. I hope you'll give this one a try. It's sweet potato soup. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead.
Next week, we calibrate our sprayer. We get a behind the scenes view of what it takes to get a golf course ready for the NCAA championships and worldwide television coverage. And we take on a pest that's feeding on our squash plants. So join us then for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. Hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.